Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on Christian History and Missions, PC201. So in today's class, we would be studying on the Reformation, which led to revival. So even before we could begin with our class, let's pray. Um, Anita, would you like to pray? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this time, Lord, as we are gathered here, Lord, to learn from your word, Lord, to learn the history and the missions that took place, Lord. Bless this time, Lord, and bless Pastor Nancy, Lord, and all the students can join on time, Lord, or give them a good network connectivity, Lord. I, I give this time into your hand, Lord, and Holy Spirit guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Yeah. Uh, so we'll begin with our session. Even before we could. Okay. Uh, I'll wait for the others to join as we wait. Uh, can we catch up in what we covered last week? So what did we learn? I requested you all to also watch some movies on John Wycliffe and John Haas for a better understanding and to get a clear picture. Uh, did anyone watch? Uh, or, or read about Joan of Arc or Savonarola. What was your learning on these two people? Anyone in the class would like to share? Was there anyone in the class who read upon these two people? Joanne of Arc and Savonarola. A few points about them that you could, uh, it stood out for you when you were studying about them. Anyone, Anita, Rosalind, Jeffina, Lubega, if there's anyone, if you would like to share on these people. Or what was your learning from last class? Um, last class we learned about John Wycliffe and also about John Hess. It was actually very inspiring, like how they spent their whole life for God. And they were even John Hess was burnt at the stake, and I couldn't even imagine how he can go through that. And um, it's so good at how the word spread and how the word continued spreading through them and john wickliffe was known as reformation morning star and i learned a lot of things and all these are really inspiring like uh, we should do anything for god like literally anything whether it is small big or whatever it is um, we should be ready even to give our whole life to god uh, it's easy to say it but when we think of giving our life, it's hard to imagine. But still, uh, we should give our whole life to God. So, yeah, I really loved it. Ma'am, you're on mute. Thanks. Thanks, Rosalind. <laughs> That's a good thought. OK, so is there anyone who'd like to share uh, on on your learning from Joanne of Arc or Savonarola, the reading assignment that we gave last class, the personal reading to know about these two people? Yes, please go ahead, Lubega. You can unmute and share about them. Uh, I think, uh, good morning, everybody in class. I think that gentleman was hanged. Who was hanged? Can I get that name? 
that he has an S name which is very long to pastor Samuel Savonarola. Uh -huh. So I think he was hanged, but he was he looked a, char a charitable guy. He helped some people get some charitable loans. He was helping people who were starving. He was excommunicated by one pope, and I think lastly he was hanged because I don't think that he lived his life after being hanged. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the article says that his preaching got him burned. So if. Um, Giroloma Savonarola was hanged and then burned at a stake on May 23rd, 1498. So what you said was right, yeah. Yes, that's what the... Anyone else who read about him would like to share? Or Joan of Arc? John, Roslyn, Zelly. Okay. Okay, next class onwards, we take our reading assignment series. So what we do is we read about the people whom we are asked in the class, and then we share a few points about them in the first five to 10 minutes. Okay. So next class, we'll come prepared. Okay. I request you all to please read through Joanne of Arc, Savonarola. Okay. And then in today's assignment, I will give it to you all at the end of the class. Okay, so we today we're going to study about the Reformation, which led to revival. This is from uh, 1501 AD to 1880 or 1800 AD. Okay, so we're going to study on Erasmus, who was a Dutch scholar and a monk who was turned into a writer. <coughs> me a minute please i said this right okay so erasmus is was uh, his full name uh, was Desirius Erasmus, and he was one of the most celebrated scholar of his time. So uh, he was he was corresponded with the kings, popes, princes, and fellow scholars, and his works were translated into many languages. So uh, toward the end of his career. We see Erasmus was drew into cri criticism from both the Roman Catholics and the Protestants for his religious ideas. So keeping that in mind, let's go, let's move on into his personal life. So he was the legitimate son of a priest. And Erasmus was born in a Rotterdam in Netherlands. He attended a school which was run by monks. And eventually he entered into the Augustian order. So when we say Augustian order, we studied about the two Augustians. Um, one was Augustian of Hippo who became the bishop and he started the monastery. So there was another Augustian of Kattenberg who moved to England. So we're talking about the Augustian of Hippo who started a monastery and he was into he was a monk in under his order. So later, after complaining that he had been pressured into joining the order, he received permission from the Pope to li live outside the monastery. So in 1492, Erasmus became a priest. So what happened? Several years later, he went to Paris to study theology. However, what happened here is he disliked the studies because of his professor's use of scholasticism, a medieval method of studying religion. So he began to focus more on his attention on the study of classical literature. So eventually he left Paris and he began working as a tutor while pursuing his own studies. So in 1499, he traveled with one of his pupils to England. 
we made lifelong friends, including humanist writer Thomas Moore. So seven years later, Erasmus accompanied some other student to Italy, where he received a degree in theology from the University of Turin. So, however, the theologians who had completed the strict course of studies in Paris looked with scorn on his achievement, believing his degree from Turin had little academic values. So, after a second stay in England, Erasmus settled near Brussels that is in the present day Belgium, um, home to one of the courts of Burgundy. So it was already known through his publication. Erasmus served as an advisor to the prince who later became holy emperor of Charles V. Although he agreed with some of the ideas we are going to study after him, we will be studying on Martin Luther. So they lived in the same period of time. So although he agreed on some of the ideas that was proposed by Martin Luther and his followers, but he strongly disapproved of their efforts to break away from the Catholic Church. So some people at the court accused him of supporting the Lutherans. So to escape his this uneasy situation that was around him, Erasmus moved to Basel, Switzerland, where he remained there until about 1529 AD. So at that time, the city formally turned the Protestants and Erasmus moved to Germany. So here we see uh, his work and thoughts. We see that as a scholar of uh, you know, uh, as a scholar, Erasmus produced many written works during his career, like writing only in Latin. He created essays, uh, then uh, letters of collection of proverbs and textbooks containing amusing stories, and he advised uh, to the princes, the advisors, whatever the advisors was given to the prince, he started writing and then some biblical studies. He also penned books on preaching, morals, religion, and the value of marriage. So when, when his completed works were published in early 1700, they filled 10 very large volumes. So some of Erasmus' uh, most influential work were his books on religion, where he could edit and translate volume of church fathers that shaped the Christianity in the early century. And he also wrote a biography of, of one of them, like St. Jerome or Father Jerome. He wrote a biography of him. And he also produced works criticizing the church spelling out the uh, recommendation for reform. And also we see Erasmus' most important contribution was towards this religious scholarship, was his work on the Bible. He applied scripture, the same critical method that many uh, Renaissance scholars were using to edit classical manuscript. And he was known for writing <coughs> many things and keeping the record of all these uh, books. Excuse me, give me a minute. So in the area of politics, we see Erasmus promoted the goal of peace and universal fellowship among the human beings. So in works such as War and uh, there's a book he released, War and Sweet to Inexperience, and he urged leaders to look for ways to resolve the differences without the usual of military force. Erasmus also applied his, uh, this principle to conflict within the church. And he recommended that revival religious groups hold a council to settle their disagreement. We also see um, 
Erasmus works on the education. It reflects the views of many Renaissance humanists, uh, which says on the education of the children, which was released in 1529. He declared that the parents had a duty to choose teachers who would provide moral and intellectual leadership for their children. And he also disapproved the physical punishment and believed in encouraging learners by challenging them, engaging their interest and rewarding them for good behavior. Yeah, with that, we see um, <clears throat> both Catholics and the Protestant attacked Erasmus during the final decade of his life. So the Catholics criticized his translation of the New Testament, which seemed to challenge the authority of the Bible by introducing changes in the words. And in 1531, we see the professor of theology in Paris condemned Erasmus' religious writing. Why? Because the Spanish Inquisition also investigated his works. And eventually, some of his works were banned in France, Italy, and Spain. Meanwhile, Protestants were attacking Erasmus for withdrawing his support for the Lutherans when he realized that their movement would lead to a split within the church because he didn't want any such thing to happen. But then his refusal to take side in the Reformation debate made him unpopular with these extreme groups on both sides. Still, the tradition of Christian humanism that Erasmus established remained alive, especially in England and Netherlands. So we see readers of um, 1700s admired him for creating a theory of religious based on reason. So in 1900, we see the interest in his works revived again. And we see the new edition of his writings began to appear. Uh, <clears throat> so with that, we will move on to Martin Luther, who lived in the same period of time. And we'll see how Martin Luther, <laughs> sorry, give me a minute, please. Excuse me. Thank you. We are going to see study on Martin Luther, and we are going to see uh, uh, how Martin Luther uh, brought in the Reformation. So Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483 in Island, Sac Saxony. Saxony is now known as Saxony Anhalt in Germany. And he died in February 18th, 1546 in in the same place in Germany. So he was a German theologian and a religious reformer who was the catalyst of the 16th century for Protestant Reformation. So through his words and actions, we see that Luther created a movement that reformated certain basic tenets of Christian belief and resulted in the division of the Western Christendom between the Roman Catholic and the new Protestant traditions were birthed. So many Lutherans, Calvinism, Anglicanism, and Anabaptist, and the anti tritarians So he is one of the most influential figures in the history of Christianity. We see that soon after Luther's birth, his family moved to Germany to a small town called Mansfeld. Some say like it is about 10 miles or 16 kilometers to the northwest. And his father was Hans Luther, who, proposed, who, who prospered in the local copper refining business and uh, um, became a town councillor of Mansfeld in 1492. So there are a few sources of information about Martin Luther's childhood, apart from his recollection as an old man. So understandably, they seem to be uh, colored by a certain uh, romantic things in his life. But we will look into his early life, like his education. So he was educated in a Latin school in Mansfeld in 
spring 1488 and there he received uh, a, a training in latin language and he learned by root the ten commandments the lord's prayer the apostles creed okay and we also see that morning and evening prayers were introduced and in 1497 luther was sent to nearby magdeburg a place called Magdeburg to attend a school operated by the Brethren of the Common Life, a lay monastic order whose em who emphasis on personal pity apparently exerted a lasting influence on him. Give me a minute, please. Yeah. So <clears throat> in 1501, he matriculated at the University of Erfurt at the time, one of the most distinguished universities in Germany. And we see that his matriculation records described him as in, uh, you know, he was ineligible for financial aid and uh, indirect testimonial to the finance success of his father. So Luther took the customary course in liberal arts and he received a bachelor uh, degree in 15 top two so three years later he was awarded as the master's degree uh, and he, his studies gave him uh, exposure to scholasticism many years later he spoke of aristotle and william of oclam as his teachers so he was been graduated as an arts faculty and luther was eligible to pursue his graduated work in three higher disciplines like law medicine or theology so in accordance with the wish of his father he, he studied the law uh, so in the second half of 15th century, he joined the Augustian order and become uh, that had become the two divided into factions. So one seeking reform in the direction of order's original strict rule, and the other was favoring the modification. So the, mon the monastery of Luther joined in effort was part of the strict observation faction. So two months after entering the monastery on September 15th in 1505, Luther made his general confessions and was admitted into the community as a novice. But Luther would not settle for uh, <clears throat> any of the routine or the existence of monk because, yes, he's from a law background and he saw how the religious practices or um, the rituals that was introduced in the church much later was taking more prominence in the church and that which was not uh, any way relevant for the spiritual growth so he had to stand up for certain things and that's what they say um we read that uh, you know erasmus loaded the cannon that luther fired it Okay, so he going through the many teachings and, you know, Erasmus was a, a good writer. So by now, what happened is, is they both have been a, a, a scholar and a leader in the church and they are saying certain things that were not relevant to the Christianity or to the early church, but recently, which has been practiced. So this... This brought a reformation. So they stood up and they wanted to, uh, you know, stand against certain practices that was not right. So what happened? Um, Luther posted 99 theses. So he writes uh, 99 theses and he posted on the, just give me a minute, I'll just post that uh, picture.
a minute, please. I want to show something on that. So sometime during the October 31st of 1517, a day before the Feast of All Saints, Martin Luther was about 33 years of old and he posted these theses that he wrote on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. So the door functioned as a bulletin board for various announcements related to the academic and church fairs. So the theses were written in Latin and he printed on a foil sheet by the printer John Gutenberg, the printing press who was introduced. So Luther was calling a disputation on the power and the efficacy of indulgence out of love and zeal for truth and the desire to bring it into the light. So he decided as a faithful monk and priest who had been appointed as a professor of the biblical theology at the University of Wittenberg, a small virtual unknown institution in a small town. So some of the core piece of these theses were sent to the friends and the other church officials. But the disputation never took place. So Albert of uh, Brandenburg, uh, who was the Archbishop of Mainz, sent these theses to those, some of the theologians who, um, you know, judgment moved him to send copy to Rome and demand action against Luther. But what happened? In the early month of 1518, these theses had been reprinted in many cities and Luther's name had become associated with the demands of these radical change in the church and he had become front page news. So Luther was calling for a debate on the most neutralistic issue of his time. So we see the relationship between the money and the religion of indulgence, uh, because this was taking more prominent place in the church and he wants to come against it. So it become the complex instrument for granting forgiveness of sins. And, you know, uh, the granting of forgiveness in the sacrament of penance was based on the power of the keys given to the apostles according to Matthew 16, 18, and was used to discipline sinners, penitent sinners were. So many such practices which was happening in the church was not right. So uh, Martin, uh, I mean, Martin Luther came against this. And the church was not very receptive to accept that from him. But then Martin Luther was not a person who will be giving up on any such things, but he stood his ground to make things clear. And we also see <clears throat> during his time, came against the sale of the indulgence or uh, forgiving sinners on the based on the offerings that they received. Uh, you know, there are many other things in that 95 pieces he stood against. And uh, yeah. So we see that Luther picked out a disagreeable elderly man. And yet to, one second, please. Yeah. 
we see eventually Luther was against all this and he had to move from one place to other for his protection at the same time to make a point to come against all these order and uh, there were other uh, other uh, 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 the monks and also the religious uh, nuns came against and they joined Luther's group so one of the problem uh, which was confronting Luther when he returned was a question of what to do with all the nuns who had run away from the uh, convent or the nunneries where they were there. So some of them joined the Luther's group for the point that he was making. So, uh, so the monks were with Luther and the nuns who had come, who had joined Luther's, uh, uh, Luther's group, they didn't know what to do. So including Tuvel, who had uh, been smuggled out in, uh, you know, uh, apparently they escaped from the convent and they were in the middle ages that they were not allowed to remain single as well so luther worked to find a partner for all of them and we also see that the uh, uh, history says that finally one woman was left uh, who was a 26 year old katrina from uh, uh, katrina her name is katrina who was a daughter of a poor nobleman and she had been sent to nunnery at a very young age probably her father could not afford to provide her um, to get her married so he had to send her to become a nun to a convent and when others found a partner luther could find a partner for everyone but uh, she was the only person who was left so uh, luther picked out a disagreeable like an elderly man uh, to get katrina uh, married but she refused to get married any of them and she said if i marry i'll marry either luther or any other local bachelor a young man so luther who was 42 year old had stated many times he wasn't going to get married but however he, uh, he impulsively announced that he was marrying katrina von bora so to great surprise of his friends luther was very fond of katrina referring to her as my lord kathy or um uh, my rib so in a letter he addressed uh, to my beloved wife katrina so later part he eventually got married to her and uh, for a long time uh, uh, <clears throat> he was he lived as a bachelor and now he's married and this life is changed so he writes there is a lot to get used to in the first year of marriage and one wakes up in the morning and finds a pair of pigtail on the pillow that was not there before and yeah he makes some of the comments there and we see that there had been periodic unrest involving in the german peasants so over the years and conditions had been getting worse for them due to some changes in the way the land was held so many were inspired by uh, martin luther's challenge to the authority of the church uh, to challenge the secular power as well so uh, luther was initially systematic to their struggles but as a moment gained some of the group became very violent um, you know, they started looting and killing and robbing and burning monasteries and castles. We also see Martin Luther wrote an appeal to the aristocrat to restore order by force. So the peasants were disorganized and poorly armed and were no match for the Kenites and heavily armed soldiers. So they were slaughtered by thousands and their leader, Thomas, Manza was beheaded so both besides were angry with Luther the noblemen blamed him for stirring up the people and the peasants blamed him for encouraging the nobles to use violence against them so what happened Martin Luther spent the rest of his life in Wittenberg preaching the new doctrines and creating an enormous body of written work so he wrote many books on protestant theology uh, instructing books for christian worship and living as well as hymns for congregation to sing during the service so many are still been sung even today the most famous is a mighty fortress is our god 
so which can be sung in the english in wittenberg at the castle church itself so later we see luther wrote and he met many other leaders of the Reformation, um, such as Zwingli, to try and produce a un unified statement of belief for the Reformed Church. But nothing came out of it because they were not able to agree on many of the doctrinal issues. So we see that the Protestantism spread rapidly over the Northern Germany. So how this Protestant movement raised it was a set of people, that is Luther and a set of people, protested against the Roman Catholic Church. So this group who was protesting against the Roman Catholic Church were known as Protestants. So that's how the word came. <clears throat> so uh, we see that um, uh, by the time Luther's... Uh, at the end of his moment, he established uh, in the form of Martin Luther created. Like Luther had, uh, he, uh, he had created this group and trying to protest again, uh, against the, on, on, you know, uh, some lawless deeds that was happening in the church. And he had group of people by now joined him who were protesting the church against these rituals and other indulgence practices that was happening. And they stood their ground. There were many who agreed with Luther. Yeah. So. <clears throat> So what we see here is uh, in his writings, we see that Martin Luther mocked fellow reformers, especially Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli, and used few vulgar languages in doing that because Yes, one, Martin Luther was very aggressive in nature and he was also growing old. So in fact, the, uh, the some of the histor historians says that, uh, say that the older he became, he became more crankarious. So in his later years, he said some of the things that was not very pleasant uh, against the Jews, popes, and the other theological enemies, uh, the words that, you know, they could not fit to print. So nonetheless, his last uh, accomplishments also mounted the translation of the Bible into Germany. So, which remains as a literature and a biblical hallmark for them. So, the uh, the written hymns of his, like we just said, uh, Mighty Fortress is our God, and that was also published in a larger uh, way. So, his later years were spent often in both illness and ferocious activity. So in 1531, though he was sick for six months and suffered from exhaustion, but still, even in that, he could preach 180 sermons. And he has written 50 tracks, one five, 15 tracks, worked on his Old Testament translation. And he took number of trips in that. So even beyond his uh, ability, he just did uh, certain things because he wanted to get the right teaching away to the church. So in 1546, he finally wrote out the Luther's legacy and he wrote certain things. And we also see that uh, Luther's legacy was immense and cannot be adequately summarized. So every Protestant reformer like Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Karma, and every Protestant stream, Lutheran, Reformed, uh, um, Anglicans and Anabaptists were inspired by Luther in one way or the other. On a larger canvas, his reform unleashed forces that ended the Middle Ages and ushered in the modern era. So it has been said that in most library books uh, about Martin Luther occupy more shelves than the concern with any other figure except for Jesus of Nazareth. Though difficulty to verify, one can understand why it is like to be true. So this is what all about Martin Luther, um, which led to the Protestant or the Lutheran group. 
and with that we can uh, look into the other reformers so even could look into the other reformers i wanted the class to uh, be actively engaged in so i request each one uh, to take up some of the reformers where we can uh, we get to share about them in three minutes so let me put out the name and each one can take turn to share in the next class let me put out the name so so it would be an active study because there's so much to share and talk about <clears throat> Let me go to the slide so that everyone can see it. So class decide who will take up each person to share for three minutes in next class. So we need to have a read up and share on them. I'll just give as per our notes, I'm on page 42. Maybe we can take five minutes. Three minutes would be too less to share on them. Okay. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, because we can put a seven, page forty-six. So, yeah, is there anyone in the class who have decided? Everyone will get a turn. Okay, everyone will get their turn. So, if you can choose a person, volunteers, and I can put your name against it, and next class we can talk about them so please pick the person about whom you want to talk for five minutes and yes these will be graded <clears throat> okay i'll take william tindall oh, Fina. i selected william tindall okay let me put that Okay, anyone else? Anyone else from the class, if you can pick the reformers? Okay, let me check. Rosalind? John Knox, ma'am. We are not able to hear you. John Knox. You can type. I'm John Knox. Can you hear me, Mom? Anyone from the class? Lubeka, okay, I can see everyone typing here. Yeah. Okay, Rosalind is John Knox. Rosalind, and then I see Zelly. Okay, <clears throat> Anita Zurich. 
Okay, then we have John on Okay, uh, somebody for John Calvin, is there anyone? And the Anabaptist group. Okay, I can try John Calvin. Anyone from the class? John Calvin. Uh, why is that we're not able to hear you? I can try John Calvin. Calvin. Oh, somebody took it already. Okay. Okay. Um, so we are left with Anabaptist. Okay, John Calvin. Anyone for Anabaptist? Okay, Lou Baker is doing Anabaptist. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. So next week, accordingly, we can go and share about each reformers for about five minutes, and we can learn about them. Okay, so with that, we will end the session with a word of prayer, and we go ahead with the next class. Okay, thank you for confirming. So what we can do is we can also make a presentation and uh, share about their birth, the place, uh, about their early life and uh, about the work that they did and how it affected how the Reformation happened. Okay, so with that we'll end this session with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for leading us and guiding us. Thank you that as we study about the reformers, about the leaders, we pray that, Lord, you will reform us, Lord. You will uh, revive us, O oh, Father. You will lead us to uh, do greater things for you, Lord. You will help us to do the things beyond our ability, beyond our strength, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. I pray that you will lead us and guide us, Lord, and strengthen us in every area of our life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. See you all in the next class. Thank you.